10,000, 10,000, 10,000. I've hit 10,000 subscribers on my channel and I wanna thank all of you who watch my channel and put up on my rants and my craziness and my dribble. I really appreciate it. Uh, I enjoy sharing what little knowledge I have to the YouTube audience, the vinyl community, VC community as they say out there. So it's, uh, I never thought I'd hit 10,000 subscribers, um, but it's really great, it's fun. I haven't done as many of these I haven't as I've done in the past, so I may start doing more. Uh, it seems like people dig it when you talk about Blue Note or Music Matters or Blue Note or Tone Poet or Analog Productions or Blue Note. Um, so I'll try to have a few more Blue Note com things coming up, including this one today where I'm going to talk about the non-reissued Blue Note gems and the massive Blue Note catalog. You know, between Music Matters and Analog Productions and Tone Poet, they've released a lot of, you know, stellar reissues. But there's still a lot they haven't gotten to yet for whatever uh, various reasons. They've even started uh, reissuing the LT productions, which I think were from the 80s that Michael Kuskuna did when he went to the Japanese vaults and saw what they had. So they became the LT pressings uh, with a little square artwork in the middle of the white jacket and the rainbow in the upper right hand corner. But on these recordings, on these early pressings, these original pressings from the era, whether they're second or third pressings, you hear a note sustain, you hear note decay, you hear the reverb, you hear the space of the room. And it's funny, the modern pressings, you know, they undoubtedly sound beautiful. I think they sound better on a wider range of equipment than do these older pressings, but they tend to place everything way up front in the mix. That's just my take on it. Um, even with my new amplifier that I'm using, a Class D amp, that has the best sound staging I've ever had in my room, everything, Music Matters, Tone Poet, everything is up front. So anyway, we're gonna go through these nine different titles, and I hope you dig it. <laughs> Starting with John Patton Understanding, the B3 Hammond organist who, you know, is sort of overshadowed on one end by Larry Young, Young overshadowed with her sheer breadth of, of volume of LPs by Shirley Scott. Uh, John Patton released a, a goodly number of LPs on Blue Note, and they, they're they kind of weird because some of them are the boogaloo grooves of the period, which, you know, first you have the soul jazz grooves, then you have the boogaloo grooves, and when you got into the later 60s, there's definitely some of that on this record from 1968, Understanding, which was right after boogaloo and right before Accent on the Blues. Um, and I think John Patton is sort of pigeonholed into the, the boogaloo or the soul jazz corner, but on this record, uh, which is a trio, it definitely gets sort of out in places. Scott Yanow's review in allmusic.com, which that's an old story, rewarded two stars and stated the endless repetitions on these rather simplistic originals made divert alert listeners batty after a while. Give me a break. You know, there are some happening uh, improvisations on this record, some solid tunes, including, including Alfie's theme by Sonny Rollins, Soul Man by Isaac Hayes, Chitlin's Con Carney by Kenny Burrell, um, the lineup is Big John Patton on organ, Harold Alexander, and You Walk Around Drums. And what's interesting on this record, as I was listening back to all these records, is that I'd never really heard of Harold Alexander, and he plays as straight, and he plays the soul blues kind of thing, but there are definitely periods on this record where he is acknowledging, this is 1968, he's acknowledging the free jazz movement, he's acknowledging such Miles Davis records as Nefertiti and uh, Miles Smiles and uh, Kilimanjaro. There are sections where he is playing out and aggressive. Um, I'm doing a, a Horace Silva here, record here in a minute, and we have Benny Maupin on, uh, on tenor. And again, Horace Silver's soul jazz, great tunes, but Benny Maupin is definitely acknowledging in the solos on that record, the free jazz movement. So they're pushing ahead, and that's to me pretty interesting. This album recorded in 1968, uh, has not been reissued. You know, 
patent has quite a few records. You have to kind of check them out, but they're all solid organ trio records. Dig. Lee Morgan Charisma, 1969, which came out after Delightfully and before the Raja, which was currently or recently reissued by uh, Tone Poet, I believe, has a really unusual lineup. Hank Mobley, Cedar Walton, Paul Chambers, Billy Higgins, and Jackie McLean. So it's very unusual to hear Lee Morgan, Hank Mobley with Jackie McLean, who's the wild card, who pushes the tunes out of their soul jazz, you know, relaxation corner. And this is another classic uh, Lee Morgan record. He covers uh, tunes by Walton, Sweet Honey Bee, and The Murphy Man by Duke Pearson. Uh, recorded in 1966, not released until 1969. You know, it's typical soul jazz. They do a great version of Sweet Honey Bee, which is also the name of the Duke Pearson album. That's uh, one of my very favorite Duke Pearson records. It's consummate Lee Morgan. If you're a Lee Morgan fan or a Lee Morgan completist, Charisma is definitely one to get. All right. in my non-issued Blue Note titles. Three Sounds, Feeling Good. Have they reissued any Three Sounds titles? I think maybe one. Uh, I'm a big champion for the Three Sounds. What's great is they go back to the Lexington era pressings. They sound fantastic. They're all extremely well recorded, consistently record to record. Gene Harris, Andrew Simpkins on bass, Bill Dowdy on drums. And like Horace Silver Records today, Three Sounds records are kind of ignored because they're not Jackie, they're not Hank, they're not Lee, they're not Sonny. And they made a ton of records for a Blue Note. My copy here is a New York mono. They cover tunes by Benny Golson, Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, you know, and they always, they have a beautiful sense of swing. They play as one, you can tell they're listening to each other. They made about 25 records for Blue Note plus further titles for Mercury, Limelight, uh, and they were even making records for Blue Note in the early 70s uh, when their output kind of soured, and I think the label had already been sold, but they still had potential. This is Three Sounds, Feeling Good from 1960. It comes after Moods. It has the photo of, I think, Francis Alfred Lyon's wife on the cover. Maybe it's Francis Wolf's wife, I don't know. But, and it's before Here We Come. And it's just, you know, what can I say? It's, it's another great Three Sounds records. If you're not into the Three Sounds, the records don't go for much because nobody cares about them. But to me, they're the, they're the epitome of a great Blue Note recording sound. On this record in particular, you can really hear, it's weird because this is one record where uh, Rudy's piano sound is great because Gene Harris is the star of this trio and, the, and it's a trio and the piano is up front and you can hear the drums in the back of the room um, and the bass is light but uh, you can really hear the depth and the dimension of the recording studio. Even more so than on some Horace Silver records, uh, Gene Harris's piano is way up front. So 1963 sounds feeling good. Silver, you got to take a little love from 1969. This is a really unusual lineup. It's one of the last iterations of Horace Silver's group. The Randy Brecker, Benny Maupin, John Williams, and Billy Cobham. Now, between Benny Maupin and Billy Cobham, you have Cobham's very snappy, almost square, I don't mean corny, but tight, rock oriented grooves. You know, he's so fast and he's 
he pops so hard. He's not like a looser guy like Lewis Hayes or a bouncy guy like Billy Higgins. So you get a different kind of feel. And as I said earlier, Benny Maupin plays some really out solos on a Horace Silver record, which is really freaky. This is right after Serenade to a Soul Sister and right before that Healin' Feelin'. Um, it's all uh, Horace Silver tunes except for Lovely's Daughter by Benny Maupin. And, and you know, I was I posted in the Jazz Vinyl Lovers group today that today's jazz record buyers kind of ignore Horace Silver records. And uh, my good buddy Greg Cass, well, in the black community, he was extremely popular because he meant a lot because he also had kind of a Latin thing going on. But I was thinking, speaking to today, his record doesn't go for much, A, because they sold a lot of Horace Silver records. You know, Song For My Father was a hit. So there are a lot of those records out there. But beyond that, I think people just kind of, it's kind of like a, a, a three sounds thing. I think because he's not avant and cool and he's not Sonny or Hank, he doesn't, even though Horace Silver was a much bigger star than Hank Mobley was, his cachet seems to have fallen. So you can get these records for not a lot of money and he made a lot of records and they're all great. Uh, Horace Silver was a great piano player. He was a great composer. He was a great band leader. All the musicians who play on those records are outstanding musicians and part of that whole era. So it's really one worth searching out. Horace Silver, you gotta take a little love. Silver Trio and Art Blakey and Sabu 1955. I don't know the names of the 10 inch EPs that uh, constitute this record, but because they're 10 inch EPs, there's a lot of songs on this record. There's about 15 songs one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, it's about 15 songs on this record. You know, Art Blakey and Horace Silver together, you've got Horace Silver, this engaging, extroverted personality, sparkling piano lines, great ideas. You have Art Blakey, this anchor, this powerful anchor, who's also extroverted. So it's just, you know, it's a real riot. Then you bring in Sabu, if you can hear it there, actually. It's a firewall with Sabu and Art Blakey. So if you can find this, it's a great record. Horace Silver Trio and Art Blakey, 1955. Uh, it even came out of Liberty, so it's not hard to find. And there's one with a blue cover with him posing like that, and another one with an orange cover. <laughs> 